Well, boys and girls, we have a very special guest with us today. Um, our guest is Cheryl Nothy, and Cheryl is uh, was the Poet Laureate, and she'll explain that a little bit for Montana, which is quite an honor. She is a well-known poet, and you guys are in for a treat today. The other thing I hope is that everybody has the copy of the Montana on Animal Sonnet uh, worksheet that, that I sent out. If you have that in your possession, would you give me a thumbs up, please? Awesome. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and get started, and I'll break in a little bit and give give some uh, instructions. But also, just remember, if you have questions or something to say, um, raise your hand, and uh, your teacher can unmute your microphone and uh, ask the questions. So let's get started. Cheryl, take it away. Hello. You can all hear me? Yes, thumbs up? Great. I was lucky enough to watch you work with Carol and Patterson on Tuesday, and I'm already charmed and thrilled by all of you, um, especially you knaves, knights, nuns, and ladies in waiting uh, in the Renaissance Fair. So, my name is Cheryl Nothy, and when I was in fifth grade, I was very lonely. I didn't have friends, I wasn't popular. I didn't have the right clothes, and my teeth were chipped from jumping off garage roofs and jumping into the air and catching on the chain on the light switch. And so I was sad. It was tough. But in fifth grade, a teacher gave me five words, and she gave me my life. She said, you will be an author. And age 11, my whole life changed. And I decided that I would pursue writing as my lifetime. She gave me a script, and I hadn't had one before. I didn't know what I was going to do or be until this teacher gave me the gift of telling me who she saw me as. So I've published five books of poetry, and I was Poet Laureate. Now, <clears throat> remember Caesar? He, in the statues, he's got laurel leaves on a crown around his head. That's a sign of honor. So the word laureate, laureate, comes from laurel leaf, and it's a sign of great honor. And so when I was appointed, I drove all over Montana on the Greyhound bus for two years, and that was wild. How many of you have ever taken the Greyhound bus? Did you have a lot of fun? Okay, so what I love to do more than anything is write poetry, eat chocolate, and wrestle with my dogs. And so I'm also, I love working with kids, with you all. So today we're going to talk about the sonnet. Now, the sonnet is. Um, from the Italian word sonetto, and it means little song. The sonnet is 14 lines long. Now, there are a number of various styles of sonnet, but the one we're going to write today is the modern sonnet, 14 lines. You don't have to worry about the other rules for more formal sonnets. But before I can ask you to write for me, I want to work with you on, oh, here, thank you, yes. Uh, I, I forgot, and I'm glad this is up, so I can, ah, I can tell you that the uh, sonnet is based on the human heartbeat. The counting of the words, da-da, da-da, da-da. So, we all use that in our language all the time. In fact, most writing is based on the human body. So, I want to do a little bit of writer's toolbox with you because it's important to me that I get you, you know, familiar with terms. And this may be all really easy for you. Uh, the first one is metaphor. Is there anyone 
would like to define metaphor for us. Okay, I see a, a girl in a... Let the, let the teacher call. Yeah. For what school? Um, this is... Arrowhead? Arrowhead. And there's a... There's girls on the right and left who have their arms up. Um, a metaphor is... Um, like... Seeing something without like or as, that's not really true. Give an example. Like, you are a monkey or something. Yeah, good. <laughs> Any other comments? I see another girl. In Arrowhead? In Arrowhead, yeah. A metaphor gets straight to the... What? Oh. I'm going to give you an example of metaphor. When I woke up this morning, my hair was messy. Now, that's not interesting at all. But if I use metaphor and say, when I woke up this morning, my hair was a rat's nest, it's much more powerful. And then, of course, simile uses like or as. When we sang and messed around at the kitchen table, my father's vein in his head was, a thun was like a thunderstorm. So there's a simile with like. Um, the senses are hugely important because as humans, that's what we share. All the, the five senses we hear and smell and taste and feel and touch, all of us have those qualities. That's how we take in the universe. So when you're talking uh, in your writing, it's very important that you use the senses. Because if I say to you, hot buttered movie theater popcorn, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Or if I say, um, chocolate ice cream cone when the ice cream falls off on your foot in the summer. And you know what I'm talking about. So the senses are huge, and you will convey the feeling to the person immediately. If I say the smell of bear scat, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, detail. I'm going to uh, talk about someone in each classroom. I'm just giving the details, however. So you don't know who they are, but I'd like to start with, is this C.S. Porter? Uh -huh. C.S. Porter. C.S. Porter, okay. So I'm, I'm, going, I'm thinking about a person. Okay, now this person is deep in thought, and this person has dark hair, white sweatshirt, and a tiara. Right now, this person is resting. Oh, now they're laughing. And now the boy in the good hat is pointing. <laughs> so, you see, detail tells you everything. Now, let's go down to Errol. Hey, hang on just a minute. C.S. Porter, do we have a question? Is that why the arms are raising in the back? Do we have a question? No, I don't believe it's a question. I think they're just trying to volunteer. Oh, gotcha. Oh, no, this is a secret, man. She's going to she's gonna pick somebody. <laughs> okay, okay. good for her. Good, let's go. Uh, Arrowhead. Arrowhead, okay. I'm thinking of someone in the classroom. This person has a black baseball cap on and a red T-shirt with blue designs, and this person is resting their head on their chin and not quite sure. Oh, yes, you know who it is. You want to point at who it is? <laughs> Details. The picture is not complete without details. Shakespeare kids. I'm going to describe someone with details. Y'all can hear me? Yeah. Okay. This person has a black top and their hair's pulled back and they have a headband on and they're holding a pen and they're smiling beautifully. Shakespeare kids, who am I talking about? That's right. That's right. <laughs> now... Seely. Seely. You're kind of hard to see, but I'm going to, I'm thinking of someone in this classroom, and this person is wearing a green sweatshirt with a white collar, has dark hair, and is sitting with their, oh, now they look, they're looking around. Who could that be in the green t-shirt? Now their arms are crossed. They have black hair. They're looking around. Oh, they're moving. Oh, can you point to who? Yes. 
So you see, I can say I'm thinking of a person in a room full of people, but when I give the detail, then you get who I'm talking about. Okay, so now the line break, which is the secret heart of poetry. In prose, you've got a block of language in sentences, like a mountain. But poetry moves like a waterfall. Poetry has different vocabulary. So I'm going to show you a poem that best illustrates and the line break. It. They should have this. And can you take a look at it? I believe it's on your worksheet. It's called SMART. And it's also up here. Now, the writer who wrote this wants you to hear it in your mind as the writer meant it in their mind. Well, how do you do that? The line break. You tell someone where to pause, where to move on. The last word on the line is very important because it's leading to what's next. So this poem is called Smart, like the fox, who grabs a stick and wades in, out into the water, deep and deeper, till only his muzzle's above it. His fleas leap up and up onto his head, out onto the stick, which he lets go. Off it floats as he swims to shore, shaking himself dry. Now, if you look at words like deep... Other way. <laughs> there you go. Oh, I'm so sorry. This is backwards. Um, words like deep and deeper, they're alone. Other way. There ah, you go. Deep and deeper. Got it. They're alone on the line, and they're surrounded by white space. That's because they're so important. That's because the author wanted you to hear deep and deeper. And it's the same with his fleas leap up and up. It, white space shows time and attention. Now, do you know, is a fox, well, what did this fox do? What was his trick that he did? How about uh, somebody in Arrowhead? Okay. What did the fox do? He turned by going into the water and onto the onto the, they went onto the stick and let go of the stick to get rid of them. Okay. Now here's the real question. Good job. Good job. Is a fox smart enough? To know that fleas can't swim and abhor water? Is a fox smart enough to know when he's scratching himself that there are little creatures that hate water and he can go in the water and drown them? What do you think? Seely, what do you think? Is a, is a fox that smart? I know you have foxes up there. I see them all the time. Seely, what do you think? Fox, yes. 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 How do you say yes? Thumbs yeah, up. Yes. Thumbs up. Yeah. And how many say no way? All right. All right. <laughs> so now they're. <laughs> how about C.S. Porter? You and the beautiful red hat. <laughs> you. Uh, do you think a fox is smart enough to deflee himself by going in the water with a stick? Sure. You would probably need a little bit of time to figure that out, though. The fox would, or you would? Yeah, time to, time to figure out that People. they're fleas, little creatures on them. Yeah. Um, the poet who wrote this poem, there's no answer. So there's no right or wrong answer. And that's common in poetry. You are allowed in poetry to not be correct, to be weird, even. Okay, so we've looked at the line break, and now have I made it clear to you that uh, at the end of the word fox, at the end of that line, it ends, that's called a line break. And then who grabs a stick, when that ends, that's a line break, because it moves on to the next line. Okay, right. let's, let's pause here for just a minute, and let's go to Shakespeare Kids. Shakespeare Kids, do you have any questions for Ms. Nothi right now about poetry? I'm not sure they can hear us.
Yeah, they're locked up. Right. Well, okay, how about C.S. Porter? Any questions there so far? No. Okay, how about Arrowhead? We good? Oh, we have one at Porter. Okay, Porter, go ahead. Why do you find so much, so much interest in poetry? Good question. Great question. Because I was lonely, and I didn't have anyone to talk to. I didn't have a lot of friends, but I had all these feelings. And so in fourth and fifth grade, I started writing them all down so that I knew what, why I felt like I did. And then I discovered that once you start writing poetry and once the imagination takes hold, you don't know where you're going to end up. You can end up on Mars or in Zanzibar or... So it was for imagination and curiosity and loneliness. Good question. Um, why not novels? Why, why not poetry? novels? Uh, because I don't have the attention span to write a novel. I give somebody a name, I name their dog, I tell what color their truck is, and then I forget the dog's name. So poetry, with its short lines, I can remember to write. There's some hands up at Arrowhead. Okay, Arrowhead, questions? Um, did you get, like, did you have to read to people? I had a girlfriend who didn't like her bedroom walls, and so she hung sheets to cover them up. I gave her the poems, and she taped them up behind the sheets. I was too shy to read out loud yet. It took me a while. But now do you read poetry to people? Yes. Yes, I love to read poetry to people. It's my favorite thing to do, besides chocolate dogs and shoes. How about in the red bandana here at Arrowhead? At Arrowhead. Um, why did? How did you find interest in the first place with poetry? I was a big reader. I read everything I could get my hands on. When I visited my friends, whose parents could afford to give them subscriptions to Donald Duck Comics and Mad Magazine, they'd get mad at me because I'd grab the magazine and start reading. I just always wanted to read everything I saw. And so when I discovered poetry, I thought, oh, now I can talk about it. How about an arrowhead? This girl uh, in the purple shirt, gets, she's sitting like this. Sky. You! Sky. Sky. What's your favorite type of poetry? Do you have a favorite type? Like, do you like limericks or do you like rhymes? Like, do you have a favorite type? I don't rhyme. I don't write limericks. Music has changed from an orchestra in suits to rap. Poetry has changed from formal, rhyming, metered to a snapshot of what's in your heart and soul at once. And so my favorite form is called free verse. All right, there's a girl in a green sweatshirt, gray sweatshirt with a pink butterfly. Yes, honey. How old were you when you started poetry? Eleven. How old are you? Eleven. Hey! <laughs> How about <laughs> Seely? Does Seely have any questions? Seely's just hanging out. Okay. And how about Shakespeare kids? Do you have any questions? Nope. Okay. Let's get them writing. Yes! <laughs> Um, did you ever think about changing your mind and being a different kind of author or decide that she, or think at one point that maybe you didn't want to be a writer? For me, writing poetry <clears throat> is a habit of being. It's like eating or drinking. It's how I get through my life. And so I've tried to write stories and novels, but by page two I've forgotten the names and I've killed everybody off and the truck rolled into a river. Poetry with its brief lines and condensation of thought works perfectly for me, whereas I'm not really the type to be able to write a novel or short stories. <laughs> That's why you get good at it. Okay, let's get them writing. Okay. The first thing that I'd like you to do um, is to make a list of animals in Montana. Now, think about the huge variety of animals that we have in our state. We have bison. We have owls. 
that can listen and hear a mouse under two feet of snow from 100 feet and dive and catch it. We have pike that look like dinosaurs. We have bison, osprey. We have egrets. We have pelicans. Do we? We have mountain goats. We have mice. So make a list of as many animals as you can think of that live in Montana. So why don't we take about three to four minutes and we're going to mute our microphone and it's your turn. You should have on your worksheet a spot to just make a list and teachers, if you want them to talk to each other, that's fine or they can just do it on their own. Um, but let's, let's brainstorm. Just dump out, out of your brain all the animals you can think of that live in Montana. That's the only structure, the only criteria. Hey, how we doing? Thumbs up. Did you get some animals listed, everybody? Great. Great. Um, I would like to have one person from Sealy share their two favorite animals from their list. So, Sealy, pick somebody and let's hear two of your favorite animals. Just one person. Go, Sealy. Wolves and red foxes. Wolves and red foxes. Those are awesome. Okay, let's go to Arrowhead. Now, Arrowhead, you can't say wolves and red foxes. So one person, what's two animals off your list? Grizzly bears and crows. Grizzly bears, crows, wolves, and red foxes. Okay, Shakespeare kids, you can't say those four. Who would like to respond from Shakespeare kids? Bison and red blackbird. Bison and red winged blackbird birds, wolves and red foxes, and what was the other ones? Crows and something. Grizzly bears. Oh yeah. Okay, Porter. You're the last. What are your two? Mountain lions and turkeys. Oh, Mountain <laughs> lions and turkeys. I love it. Turkeys are in my backyard. That's great. That's great. That is awesome. My favorite's a wolverine. So awesome. Well, we're going to go ahead and here and go to the next step in your assignment. Go ahead. All right. The next step. I'm going to read you my Montana sonnet that I wrote for you for this presentation. <clears throat> Mine is a modern sonnet, which means it's 14 lines long. <clears throat> Please listen and even note if you want to answer after, what senses do I use? And what kind of verbs do I use? Are you ready? Okay, Montana sonnet. Now, I took the title of this sonnet from the title of Shakespeare's Soliloquy. And I thought it was important to connect back to Shakespeare, but his sonnets were much more formal. Ours won't be. Okay, so, to be or not to be, that is the question. The shining feather loosed from an eagle's wing swirls alone over the mountains, waiting for the child who will discover it. In the muck of dead leaves, the detritus after snow melts, the smell of mushrooms and must. This old secret world beneath roots and rocks, where the snowy owl listens to the deep scrabble of a mouse and makes an early lunch out of him. A wheel of rattlesnakes uncoils on the warm stones. The shriek of a cougar on the hill sounds human. Beside the river in springtime, which roars with snow melt, the force of the current is a stampede of wild mustangs. The force of the bitterroot blossom returns long past our lifetimes. There is no question but to be. 
So I'd like to ask students, Seely Lake? Yeah? Yeah. Tell me some of the sensory images you heard. So you said the smell of the mushrooms and must. Right. And do you all know what detritus is? Look at the camera. <laughs> do you know what detritus <laughs> is? No. Garbage. Leftover stuff. Last year's leaves in muck with moss. All right, let's go to Arrowhead. Will the teacher appoint someone to read what, read what sensory images they liked? The shriek. The shriek. Any other one? Ava? Maybe one? No. No? The wheel of rattlesnakes. The wheel of, the wheel of rattlesnakes. Unfolding on the rock. Um, okay, let's go to the Shakespeare kit. The force of the current is a stampede of wild mustangs. You like that one? That's my favorite. It's my favorite too. Yeah. <laughs> cool. We're a lot alike, aren't we? <laughs> Who knows? Yes, we all are a lot alike. All right, let's jump over to that Renaissance crew. Can you tell me some sensory images? This old secret world beneath roots and rocks. Have you ever been out in the yard and picked up rocks and looked at that whole unseen world that's so busy? Yeah. Yeah, it's fun, isn't it? Especially with grass, too. The roots of the grass. Yeah, I love roots. Yeah. So, Woo! I'm going to ask you to write a 14-line sonnet. I want you to think about the animal and how you're going to bring it to life. What does it look like? How does it move? I mean, you know how cats move. They're big and slow and gentle. And you know how mice move and how rabbits move. What non-animal could you compare it to and why? For example, my chihuahua, I, tell, I say he's Ed Sullivan. He's got a worried little old man's face and his ears are always up in the air and he's always wondering, when do we eat? I could wither up and blow away. Uh, so you can give human qualities or machine qualities. What does it smell like? What does it sound like? Now, when I had that line about the cougar, we live right at the foot of Mount Jumbo. And one night, we heard what we thought was a woman screaming. <coughs> oh, and we jumped up and we ran to the window. And we said, maybe we should call the police. Somebody's hurting a woman somewhere. Well, it quit. And then we went back to bed. And the next day, I was in the backyard and I went, Bob, come here and look at this. There's a gigantic kitten on the hill. And it was jump rolling and gambling. And my husband said, that's not a big kitten. It's a cougar. <laughs> but it was cute. Um, how, how are you going to make the setting vivid in your Montana animal sonnet? You know, one of the ways that you do that is to talk about the habitat. What's it surrounded by? You know, the shape of the nest is built to fit the body of the bird. And so I'm going to give you some time to start your sonnets. And then... Partway through, I'll come back and I'll ask you to just read me some of your lines. You don't even have to read the whole sonnet. 
You don't even have to finish the whole sonnet. Although I expect you all being experts, after I watched you with Carolyn on Tuesday, I expect you'll do very well. So are you ready to put your sonnet together? Do we have any questions before we start writing? I'm looking for Ray's Tana. Read um, a couple of lines you've gotten so far and share with us. Okay. <clears throat> the wild wind blew through the long, glorious mane of the frightened wild mustang. The cougar, who had given the horse a scare, was as determined as a dog sprinting after a bunny. Awesome. Very good. Okay, now I, I'm going to teach the kids something. You may not even know this. Okay, so when we're in a poetry reading, this is how we tell people we're, we're really like their poems. So after somebody reads a line, everybody, ready, go. <laughs> oh, play along, Seely. Come on. <laughs> okay, see us. Uh, Seely, do you, oh, there, there, they're going. Seely, do you have somebody who has a line to share? A line or two or five. You're on. A white shining light from the sea, it jumps not looking at me. It's big and scary with sharp pointy teeth. I cast my line, but nothing seems to see. Oh, all right. Is that a pike? That was something in the ocean. Okay. <laughs> Excellent, Seely. How about Arrowhead? Does somebody have one to share? American falcon. There's a fastest animal on the planet. He lives on the sides of the cliffs, up and up. He bolts down fast as lightning to catch his prey. He snatches it up. Like, it's a piece of cake. It smiles as it choked the turkey. Blah. Death. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> smiles as it choked the turkey. Awesome. <laughs> Anyone else at Arrowhead have something? Oh, great. How about the guy in the... Oh, the teacher will pick someone. Okay, I can see. Nice and Mustangs are cool, they smell like horse sweat, but they run like the wind. The Mustang runs at the cougar, chases it. The dog chases the Mustang. That's all I Lovely! Thank yeah. you! All right. Now, who else would like to read? I saw their hands up. At, yes, in the back, the boy with the black shirt, whose hand is up. Jack the Brown. Nice and long. Okay. Dog. Dog is like a wolf. I don't know what it smells like. <laughs> the habitat is home. It moves on four legs and Walk very slow sometimes. It looks like a wolf and, or a fox. Dogs are better for the cars because you can play with them. Good job. Okay, let's move on to C.S. Porter. Okay. Little bird chirping, chirping all, all day long, chirping a little song, a little song, a song about spring, springtime, a time of joy, a little meadow lark, chirping a little song, found another lark, chirping a little song, chirping all day long. Hey. You know, I have been hearing this beautiful call, and I say, Bob, what is that? And he says, a meadow lark. So, when you read that, I immediately heard the call of the meadowlark. All right, someone else? How about that nun? The guy nun. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guy nun! Do I have some lines to read? I put all 
She's a girl. she's a girl nun. Oh, girl nun. Oh, girl nun. Sorry, oh. we couldn't tell. Sexist. It was wishful thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Get your wimples straight. <laughs> yeah. I watch as the bees glide through the air from one flower to the next, and the elk resting peacefully on a bed of bright green moss. Oh, yeah. Yay! Yeah. You should make a little, a little louder. Okay. Oh, yes. The mohawk of the kingfisher, like a mountain ridge. Getting messed up every time it flies. Its beak gleaming like the sun. The fish feels mortified. That's wonderful! I like your vocabulary. Good job. Okay. Are, is the Tin Man going to read? <laughs> He's a knight. <laughs> the deer jumping, leaping through the bodaciously green woods over the stream, running faster than the wolf on a hunt. Nice. Good job. Okay, let's see if we've got one more from Shakespeare Kids. Oh, uh, we'll come back. <laughs> Wait. Go with Shakespeare Kids. Anybody? Okay. Um, a petite sparrow frantically whooshing about makes a dive for a naive insect tentatively balanced on the tip of a leaf, falling like lightning spiraling down a flight of both frenzy and silk. What are you a pro? Are you a pro poet? Are you a ringer? They just put you in there. That's great. <laughs> These are all Thanks. awesome. You guys are so remarkable. Great. Right. Okay. Any more in Sealy? Sealy, are you there? Are you there? <laughs> can you hear me? They can hear you. Are you awake? Do you want me to go out for coffee? <laughs> is someone okay you in the red that just pointed at me in the back would you read something yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right i read mine about leeches so it's gonna be interesting <laughs> leeches <laughs> leeches are very cool and by cool i, I mean not they <laughs> live on rocks and ponds and eat only a anything there. The cow minds his business, but then he gets thirsty, so he wades in the pond. Well, leeches are thirsty too. <laughs> Good old leech farms. I think the leech guy needs to go to the Renaissance. <laughs> Anyone else that's lively and awake? You know, you're not going to get punished. You can't do anything wrong in poetry unless you say something bad about me. <laughs> Go ahead. Come here, Megan. Nice and Megan? I hate gophers. I chew them. They smell like little beans. They... They... They scurry across the ground like ants. They squeak and squeak. They dig holes in the ground. <laughs> so that's good. Go for hair. Okay. Do we have one or two more in C.S. Porter? Of there, course we do. There was some moaning going on there. so They're dying to read. All right. Here's our surf. Good. Bison, sure. The bison whose dream is stampeding over the prairie, who's like a woolly mammoth with horns of a devil, but docile and kind like a sheep of gray, whose entire mass is used by the natives, on whose stomach a pouch, on whose head to call Mother Earth and bring peace to all. Wow! You're so good! Awesome. Any more, a porter? We have a merchant. Okay, merchant. merchant. Eyes pierce the night, white wings glide like a ghost on a light speckled background. 
The sensitive ears hear the heartbeat of a mouse, fast asleep and unawares. The snowy owl strikes. The owl races the dawn home and wins. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that owl could beat my dog home. Easy. Excellent job. Okay. Are we going to wrap up? I think we're about out of time. We're about out of time? Do I have to say goodbye? Well, not, you know, a couple minutes. Okay. I've really enjoyed watching you and listening to you both Tuesday and today. Okay, this guy here is cracking up. Is that? You see Lee. You. They, they see can't Lee. see you pointing at them. They can't. Oh. <laughs> you were laughing a lot. I was just wondering if I had spinach in my teeth or you had a, something funny. Okay. Um, keep writing. Obviously, you have natural talent. Don't let anybody tell you it's not good enough. Ever. Don't let anybody tell you you're not good enough. Ever. If you have a dream, you can do it. Because that's what I did since I was 11 years old. Don't let anybody stop you. There is no cap to your sky. Your imagination and your souls are so powerful that you must express it to be your authentic self. Okay, I'm going to show you a sign in sign language. I for I, L for love, Y for you. And this sign you can do in secret. You can pass someone and do it. Or you can wave to a whole crowd. But I have loved working with you. And, hey, let's do it again soon, huh? In person. And I'll bring ice cream drinks. <laughs>